Okay, uh, first and foremost, everybody welcome. You are all in for such a huge treat, not specifically for me because my topic of conversation is probably the least sexy uh, of all the different modules that are available here for CBW. However, um, I'm hoping to make this transition a little bit easier for people who are relatively new to bioinformatics, <clears throat> uh, but more so importantly, um, I'm hopefully going to make things a little bit easier because you're going to be drinking from the fire hose uh, throughout this week. Um, and if anyone's ever done that as a child, because uh, I know I have on those hot summer days, it's not the most fun thing to do, but boy, is it entertaining to watch it on YouTube. Okay, so let's get a couple particulars out of the way. Um, Creative Commons. The slides that I have available, both in PDF format and in Keynote, are available on the website. You guys all hopefully have the link. If not, I will link up to them. Um, use it take it, abuse it, do whatever. Please don't put it up on TikTok as a meme and make fun of me. Um, that's just hurtful. Uh, but other than that, go nuts. You know, I'm, I'm more than happy for people to uh, take some of the, the stuff that we've created uh, and, and kind of share it among other people and other individuals uh, and kind of make it your own. Have some fun with it and, and, and go out there and start teaching as well. Okay, so the topic at hand here is data formats and databases. Um, again, the least sexy of all the modules. Uh, most people want to start working with kind of somatic mutations, gene expression profiles, and things like that almost immediately. But hopefully for the next uh, kind of hour and a bit, um, I'll be able to kind of hold your hand and get you familiar with some of the files that you're going to be working with, because there's going to be a lot of them. Okay, so I've been doing this for about 13 years now. I think my first day I actually talked to Francis and boy, was that fun. Um, along the way, I've joined several other labs, and it never fails that the first day, someone just drops a whole crap load of hard drives right into my lap, and they say, do something with this. This was my first day uh, when I was over at the Hospital for Sick Children uh, back in 2014. And when I went over to Princess Margaret Hospital, they just pointed me to the cluster in a folder and said, here, work with this. So a lot of the times you are just going to get a whole lot of data and it's not necessarily going to be organized or at least organized in a way that you're familiar with or that you're comfortable with. Um, but you're going to kind of flip through the files and, and see all these different things where you'll have character based files all over the place and binary files that need to get converted over to character based files. It's just going to be somewhat of a, a mess at times because no one ever organizes things in the exact same manner. Um, from institute to institute, or even from person to person sometimes. So what are we going to do today? Today, we're actually going to, to focus in on a few uh, data formats specifically that I deal with pretty much on an everyday basis. Um, by the way, everyone, if you guys have questions, I have my Slack channel open. Um, feel free to, you know, if you don't feel comfortable saying it out loud, put it up uh, on Slack. Uh, I'm watching that. Uh, put it on the chat in Zoom or just turn your mic on and just ask a question and no problems whatsoever being interrupted. So these are the types of data formats we're gonna deal with. We're also gonna to touch a little bit near the end uh, on some cancer databases um, because there's so much information and data available right now for you guys. It's absolutely crazy to me knowing that in a short span of about 13 years, how much this whole community has gotten together and said, I'm gonna make this data available. I'm gonna make you dig for it a little bit, uh, but you guys have it available so that you can either replicate some of the work I do or you can actually extend your own work by looking at more different cancer subtypes or even just expanding on the population of samples that you deal with. So let's just go right ahead and dig right into our first file format, uh, which is going to be the FASTA file. Oh, sorry, I didn't ask. Can everyone hear me okay? Just yes. thumbs up quickly. Cool. I see some nodding heads. Works. For, I always forget to ask that question. Okay. How many people here uh, have seen uh, FASTA file? Just raise your hands. I can see everybody. Okay, good portion of you guys have seen it. Um, it's a boring file format. You get a header and you get some data and that's it. That's really all it is. Worth noting though is with the header that you get, <clears throat> it's going to start off with a greater than symbol um, and then there's gonna be some text. It's gonna be followed up by some form of sequence, A, T, C, Gs and Ns. Um, now, 
case in point, that N is actually just a placeholder. You can actually substitute a whole bunch of IU PAC codes. Uh, for those of you who don't know what IU PAC codes are, there's a link down there or haven't, don't recall uh, what some of the IU PAC codes mean. There's a link down to the bottom of the slide there so you can quickly check to interpret what an R is, uh, what a Y is in terms of, is this a, a C or a T? You know, there's uh, some ambiguity behind that. Now on top of this in a FASTA file, you can actually, it's not a, I'm gonna be focusing so much more on nucleotide bases as opposed to anything else. But keep in mind that you can actually keep uh, amino acids in there. So there's protein information that can be uh, retained in this as well. Um, so there's, uh, there's kind of some flexibility in there. But just realize that in the basis of it all, it's just a header and some data. Okay, so can anyone tell me uh, what the sequence is for mitochondrial DNA for humans, base by base? Can't remember how big it is, but if anyone can actually re recite that uh, by memory, I'm going to be really impressed. I can't do that, and luckily we all have the capability of storing these things as files. And here is a FASTA file that has actual mitochondrial DNA in all its glory. Um, this particular one is downloaded from NTBI. Um, I have links at the very end of my uh, slide deck so that you guys can see that if you ever wanted to play. But again, a lot of you guys have FASTA files that uh, you have seen in the past. Um, now, along with this, um, that some text that I was telling you guys about, here they actually put information about what this is, um, some accession numbers so that you can find out where it comes from. Uh, and in general, it just gives you a bit of narrative on, on the sequence that we're dealing with. This is great. I absolutely love this. So here, you know exactly that the sequence below, what it is, where it comes from, and if I need to reference it from some online uh, database of some sorts, well, it's, it's right there for, for me to do as well. Um, so I can look it up via the accession numbers here. Next part, again, we're talking about sequence data. So again, this could be substituted in for protein, um, but right now we're dealing with the sequence of mitochondrial. Bunch of ATCs, Gs, there's some ends in there somewhere because they don't know exactly what that base is. Bless you. Um, but for more than anything else, you're just gonna get this long series of sequences. Chromosome one freaked me out the first time I ever cracked it open. Like, I don't know how many people actually open up uh, any of the, uh, the FASTA files that they look at, but this was downloaded from UCSC. Um, so this is chromosome one. And you notice the, the text for the header slightly changes. Now, to be perfectly honest, having a greater than symbol is good enough. You don't need to put anything. You will forget everything a week later of what that sequence represents, so I highly recommend putting something in there, um, but that's just me. Uh, this particular one happens to be for uh, human reference. I believe this is GRCH38, um, so it's a uh, reference uh, 38, and the thing that freaked me out the most is why are there ends all in the beginning of this sequence? Anyone know? Just turn off your mic and just yell it out, but tell me if you guys want. Oh, I saw people have some hands up. Anybody? Bueller? 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 No? Okay. Um, you'll see this on a lot of the different chromosomes. There's a whole bunch of ends at the beginning and the end, and even in the middle. So it's really the telomeres and centromeres is a whole bunch of ends. But the first time you see this, you're going to freak out. And hopefully you guys can freak out in front of me and in front of your peers here. And not when you're working with your PI side by side, asking what in the world is going on. So all these ends are just saying, well, we don't know what's going on here. But somewhere down the line, you're actually going to get yourself um, some, some bases that, that look a little more familiar. Is this familiar to anybody? I know I've read kind of some of the introductions that you guys have had on the Slack channel, and a lot of people were, um, uh, were saying that they work in cancer, and, and uh, some were talking about some of the different cancer types that they were looking at. Uh, but I don't know if this looks familiar to anyone. Um, if I said that the reverse complement of that is TTA, GGG, some people might think, okay, well, that sounds a little more familiar. Um, the telomere terminal sites. Um, so this is part of the re repetitive telomere sequences uh, that goes on. And the only reason I'm bringing this up is the, the FASTA file that you're going to encounter, it's unidirectional right now. So it's only in reference to one direction. Um, so it's not gonna start mixing and matching all the way in between there uh, for the different strands of DNA that you're working with. So this is just to keep that in mind, not really um, freaking you out if you didn't know necessarily what a telomere terminal site looked like. Um, so yes, keep in mind that they're, uh, they're unidirectional. 
And again, uh, towards the end here, what I was telling you how you have a bunch of ends in the, um, at the back end of the chromosome one. Um, so this hopefully won't freak you out too much. I actually chopped this down. There are rows upon pages of rows of ends at the very beginning and very end, because keep in mind um, that uh, the chromosome one is 250 uh, megabases long. So it's a pretty lengthy one. Okay, so you saw chromos the mitochondrial, chromos uh, mitochondrial DNA, you saw chromosome one. In humans, you know, there's 22 X and Y. Um, some people stick in mitochondrial in there, others don't, I usually do, uh, because we do some studies with uh, mitochondrial DNA. Uh, but we have all these files here scattered about. So there's one for each chromosome represented. Uh, represented. Um, and again, these are all things you could just download. I can get that reference genome you know, easily, no matter what. One thing though is working with a whole bunch of files kind of sucks. So a lot of the times what we'll do is we'll merge that and want to only deal with one full genome. So this brings us kind of to the next topic of the FASTA file itself. You don't actually just have to save one sequence in there. You can actually take one file and retain the entire uh, human reference in there if you so choose. Um, you could do the same for you know who's ever working with xenograph data. You can actually take the uh, the mouse uh, reference genome and stick it in there. If you're doing an analysis that actually requires you to do both human and mouse, you can actually merge both human and mouse together in one genome. Uh, keep in mind there's you know some similarities between those sequences in uh, in small batches of of sequences, but um, keep in mind that 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 does uh, that is a possibility. So you can actually merge as many of these individual FASTA files as you want. And so I don't know if, did all you guys do the Unix tutorial as well? Pretty much, yeah, yeah, you can see some uh, heads nodding. Um, I'm gonna be giving you guys some commands along with everything that I do here. So whenever you guys wanna revert back, you can see kind of how it is that I did certain things. And these are all executed on the command. It's not kind of recorded. I, I did some really funky, uh, keynote stuff in order to showcase it. But you can see here, I can do an LS of a directory and it just happens to have all the different FASTA files in there. Note that FASTA files themselves, the standard usually is to use either .fa as the extension or .fasta, .fasta as the extension. Oh, uh, no, you do not need to log into AWS. Um, the hands-on portion will actually be uh, held by Heather. This is all just kind of lecture notes to get you guys a little more familiar uh, with some of the uh, uh, the files that we're working with. Okay, um, so how do you how do you merge all these files together? Well, you literally just cat is the command that concatenate files together, and these happen to be all text files, uh, which is great. And you can just kind of merge them all and redirect them into a file with hopefully some useful information on it. In our case, grch38.fa. I don't know if anyone's used the grep command, but once I had that, that, that large FASTA file, since I know that the header starts with a greater than symbol, I can find out immediately how many sequences and what the actual sequence names are in that file, just strictly by doing a grep statement. So I'm gonna grep, I'm gonna use my, these particular case I'm using single quote, I'm gonna use that caret, uh, which tells the grep statement, the line has to start with this, and this is going to be the greater than symbol. So search the entire file for characters that start with a greater than symbol and then search the grch38.fa file. And you can see here, chronologically, go, we go chromosome one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all the way through 22 and uh, X, Y, and M are at the bottom, which you can't, it's kind of cut off. So that's great. Um, some people will tell me, okay, well, we have all these, anyone kind of doing more advanced uh, uh, Unix? Okay, well, I got a whole directory. I'm just going to do this. I'm going to cat chr star.fa, pipe it, and I'm going to give it a, a different file name. After I've done that, here's the catch. You'll notice that when I grep it, I'm not guaranteed that this thing is going to be in the order that I expected it. A lot of the times in kind of the Unixy world, it's going to sort things um, either numerically or alphanumerically. And in this case, because the files start with ch and r, it treats it as alphanumeric, so it kind of looks at the alphabet itself. So it starts with CHR1, then goes to CHR10, 11, 12, 13, so on and so forth, all the way down. This just, it just sets my, you know, obsessive compulsive uh, to the stratosphere. Like this just drives me nuts. So uh, I go a little bit crazy on this one. This is actually going to impact you considerably 
in the next module when you start doing alignment, and then also in the modules after that when you start looking at variants. So keep in mind that the order of which you actually merge all your uh, individual FASTA files together matters. Um, but we'll get to that again in, in the uh, subsequent um, uh, modules. So just kind of stop that right now. Let's go back and actually do this correctly because I like doing things for reinforcement purposes. It's a little more of a pain, uh, but concatenate your files kind of on a more manual basis and you will get the order again of, of what you're expecting. Okay. So lucky for us, most FASTA files are just a plain text file. There's nothing special about it. Um, it's just a plain text with some characters, ASCII characters in there. Uh, we can store sequences, uh, either DNA, RNA, or amino acids in there. Most of the focus is going to be on probably DNA and RNA. DNA for this particular section here, uh, RNA, and then you guys are working with RNA after the fact, uh, it consists of two parts, that header, and that header always is going to start with the greater than symbol and some sequence alpha characters. Um, again, subsequent to the greater than symbol, you can put kind of whatever characters you want there. I highly recommend if you guys are creating your own FASTA files to give it a name of meaning because you will forget uh, what that sequence you were working with is. Uh, multiple, store, uh, sorry, multiple sequences can be stored in a single FASTA. And here's the kicker. Pretty much all the reference genomes that you're going to be using um, is going to be in a FASTA format of some sorts. Um, I don't want to say it's only going to be FASTA, uh, but it's going to be a large portion of it. Um, so keep in mind that this FASTA file is kind of the first thing that you deal with uh, when working with some of the analysis you're going to be doing in the bioinformatics world. Okay, so who's got some questions for me? Yes, are, are there carriage returns at the end of each line or that there's the, it's just um, only prints a certain number of nucleotides on the screen? That is a fantastic question. And yes, there are carriage returns. So there's a catch, however. It doesn't have to. You can actually take that string and just keep going on forever and ever and ever and ever. And just having a, a word wrap on your terminal will allow you to see it kind of uh, in a nice viewable manner as such, uh, as the, the previous slides I showed you. Um, that's great. However, um, most, Again, there's no fixed standard, but most people will actually use either 60 or 70 characters in terms of the line width and then add a carriage return after that. But again, since it's not a standard, um, that is really dependent on the institute of which you're downloading that reference genome from. UCSC genome, uh, sorry, uh, genome.ucc.edu um, will always, at least for the last three references that I've used, have always been 60 characters long, uh, wide and then a carriage return happens after that. Great question though. Anybody else? Okay, cool. By the way, if I'm going too fast or too slow, just say, hey, moron, move it. Or slow down, moron. I don't mind, I've got no ego. Okay, let's go on to a file format called FASTQ. Um, I, this is one of those things that's uh, the concept of it really is boiling down to um, smaller segments of sequences that you want to kind of do queries on. Um, so you're going to get this, um, this particular length of sequence. You're like, I don't know what this thing is. I don't know what to do with it. But it's really just storage similar to the FASTA file format that it's just some sequence of some sorts. Here is the catch though. When you guys get sequences from someone, do you guys not wonder how confident we are that the sequence actually is what it should be? Like you have an A, a T, a C, and a G, is that T supposed to be represented, that C, is it correct? Uh, you know, is there some form of qualitative measure uh, that we can get? So, you know, can we sign some form of value to find out, you know, what is the quality of this actual base that we have for it? The answer is task Q file. So I'm just going to throw you guys in the deep end and just say, okay, well, I'm going to uh, do ahead of a FASTQ file itself. And this is what, this is just a small, um, small output from what the file is. But uh, let's just focus in on kind of one of the sequences itself. Now, keep in mind with the FASTQ file itself, um, four lines represents the sequence of interest. 
you'll see here that if I look at these four lines, and let's just isolate them for now, um, so we have a, a deep kind of look at it. Um, you're always going to be dealing with two parts, as we've talked about even with the FASTA file, that you're going to have um, a header and some data, followed up by a header and some data. Probably wondering why does the header only have a plus, and we'll get to that momentarily. So let's take a look first at this header here. So the header for the sequence portion of a FASTQ file is always going to start with the at symbol. Um, so that is always going to be the first character in that first position, followed by some string of characters that you're going to have uh, that really should be represented. In this particular case, uh, this is from the uh, short read archive uh, that I downloaded this from. And um, that's, uh, that is the accession number for the particular, uh, I think this is a cell line. This is an any one two eight seven eight that I'm working with. Uh, and then you're going to get your sequence. There's no big surprises here. You were going to get this plus symbol. I rarely, 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 rarely ever see this plus symbol accompanied by anything else adjacent to it. Um, that is just me having looked at various things and, and, and not having seen it before. Um, this isn't to say that you can't have something with it. Um, so for example, this was actually supposed to be the header for the, uh, the quality. And the header itself should have been the same as the header up top. So I just match it up here saying SRR15133.11 slash one. It should be that. Once upon a time, you know, sequences were separate files from quality values. And so they needed a way to match those things up. And that's why they kept them separate. Nowadays, I don't think I have ever seen a single instrument kind of segregate those into two different files. Also, I rarely see it that they actually use it. So we're just going to go back, and this is what you're going to mostly encounter, uh, where it's just a plus sign. So that's why I was saying before that the four lines consist of kind of like one sequence of interest. And then we're going to get over here to the actual quality of the data itself. Sorry, before I go on, um, did that make sense to people, or did I just confuse a whole lot more? OK, getting some nods there, so it looks like we're good. Okay, so here is the accompanying uh, quality. Now, I don't know about you, but looking at something saying, yeah, I have a T and the quality score for that, or the score that I have for that one is a C. That just looks a little bit messed up to me. So we're going to change these characters that you see and give it kind of a numeric value. And the way we do that is we're going to use an ASCII table. If anyone's ever looked at ASCII tables, anyone having done computer science, or any programming courses, you may have encountered this one. Uh, I just grabbed this off the web. You guys can take a look. So let's take a look at that first. Uh, the sequence that we had was a T, and its subsequent quality was a C. So let's go ahead and take that C. What we're going to do is we're going to look it up in the table and find out that it's a 67. Okay, Straight look up. So let's just write that down, saying it's 67. And then what we're going to do is we're going to subtract 33 from that. This is important. And this is kind of the standard, uh, the standard set by Sanger, where they said, OK, well, uh, the Sanger FASTQ files are always going to be offset by 33. And you may be wondering, why uh, would you offset that by 33? Well, if we actually take a look at what 33 is in the actual decimal values, you see over to the column to the left, 33 is an exclamation mark. 32 is a space bar. If you look anything before that, those are all just kind of non really specific characters. So we're trying to avoid all those uh, and, and kind of stick us into um, more kind of like char alpha character based things that we're more familiar with. Like how do you identify a null, uh, a null character without describing it as NUL? That's a really difficult thing to do. Uh, or a tab without putting all these additional spaces or a backspace or a delete key. These are just really you know, difficult uh, characters to understand. They're not even characters, actually. They're just key presses to understand. So we keep that in the range saying, OK, well, we'll subtract 33 from that one. This gives us a 34. OK, so the score that we have for our sequence of t is a, is a ASCII character of c and is some decimal value 34. OK, that's. OK, I get that. I'm willing to accept that. We can actually write it out for every single one of these um, quality scores that we have. And you can, you can literally just write them all out uh, for every single one of them. Let's go back and bring up our sequence. And we say we have a T, we have a C here, and we literally do it for all of them. And so we know what these numerical values are uh, for each of the, the bases in the sequence that we're dealing with. 
while I think that's absolutely fantastic, um, the question really comes about is, well, okay, what does this actually mean? So we actually, the only reason they, um, they, they kind of start this way is for kind of simplicity. We can assign one character, uh, which is a, a value to one base. Um, so instead of looking at that as uh, 34 under there, we'll have this long string of characters. We're just gonna have to pad on some spaces to kind of separate everything nicely, which really sucks. Someone came up with a great little equation though to say, okay, well, the quality score that we get is equal to negative 10 log base 10 of the probability that the base call is done in error. Okay, base quality is done in error. So I'm hoping that the, the, that is a very, very, very small number. So if we isolate for that probability uh, and rearrange kind of some of our terms, uh, p is equal to 10 to the negative q over 10, okay? It's a relatively straight formula, relatively simple to do, perfectly fine with that. If we take that first character where we have our nucleotide as a t and has a quality score of c, we know that c is equal, uh, is equal to 34. The q is equal to 34 on that one. Great, we've already done that previously. And we plug that into the equation and all of a sudden here we get three times to the negative four um, in, in terms of the probability that this thing is an error. How many people feel confident that the call of a T is correct? Most I see some people said shaking. I have some faith in that, that that is actually a correct call. I mean, the fact that it's uh, 0 0.00398, uh, probably that's an error. I have some faith in that one. Okay. I just taught you how to calculate it. Forget all that. That's just to get the numbers and the formulas out of the way. This table, once you've kind of have it kind of locked into your head, you'll start looking at uh, various Fred scores um, because you know things, um, how things start in terms of what character is what. You'll you'll see those in, in an almost like reading a language. Um, so you'll be able to do this kind of stuff without even thinking anymore. Um, so when you look at a Fred quality score of ten, it's a one in ten. Nah, you know, sure, it's an okay quality score. Not that much faith. I go to the extreme and looking at something, you know, at 60, and I've never seen anything with a Fred score, quality score higher than 60. Uh, it's one in a million. So I don't know about you guys. I am pretty darn confident that uh, that is the correct base if that's the case. So really, what I'm going to do is kind of remember kind of just general ranges and the scales of which these things are in. And for the most part, you should be okay. Okay, let's go back to looking at that fast queue. So we store sequences and we store quality scores uh, associated with those sequences. Uh, each read consists of four parts, the read header, the sequence, the quality score header, and again, those quality scores. Every read header is always gonna start with an at symbol. Does anyone actually know, because I call it an at symbol just because it's what I've always called it with email. I don't actually know what the, the proper name is. I guess a Google search would fix that, but uh, if anyone knows, uh, let me know. Uh, the sequence itself in this particular case has A, C, T, G, and N. And the quality score header, again, I'm just going to reinforce this, um, has a plus sign followed by some text, which should usually match the read header. Um, but again, I've never, ever, ever seen many places these days use that. So it's always just going to be a plus sign on its own, just because those four lines are always adjacent to one another. Uh, and lastly, the, the quality scores uh, are all ASCII characters. So you guys have that lookup table. You guys can actually do those calculations if you so choose. But again, Familiator is going to take over a lot of this stuff, and you'll be able to kind of look at these things and say, OK, well, that C is really a 34. That 34 is really, uh, was it uh, 1 tenth 3? So it's what, 1 in 10,000. Um, or at least 30 is. So, you know, you can interpolate on that one and say it's uh, uh, anywhere between one and 10,000, one or 100,000. Okay, so here's one little uh, kind of gotcha. I guess it is kind of a gotcha. The FASTQ file uh, for one of the, for one random one that I had available to me, it's 4.9 gigs. 4.9 gigs, my computer itself, uh, is, my laptop has 500 gigs storage on that one. Um, yeah, I'm not really going to put one, you know, five gigs of that, which I could be using for either a movie or some music for a fast queue file. So what you'll typically see here is, um, 
Hey, someone put it. Thank you for notifying that it's an at symbol. Thanks, Arana. Um, one of the things you'll notice here is some of the files you'll deal with will end in .gz. GZ just means this thing has been compressed. We don't want you to store something that's five gigs when we can actually reduce it in size and still not lose any information. So you can see we went from 4.9 gigs to about 1.5 gigs. It's about you know three three and a bit times uh, compression ratio. You know technically I can fit you know I can store three files uh, in this particular case where I could have just stored one uncompressed one. That is great because a lot of the tools you'll be using in the following days, actually this afternoon, uh, when you start looking at module three, um, that, that it actually uses that GZ file. You don't have to uncompress anything. You don't have to do anything really with it. But what happens if you actually just want to take a quick peek at your file? Do you have to uncompress the whole thing to the 4.9 gigs, take a peek using a cat statement or less statement, and then go back to compressing it? Well, no. I mean, if I just go back you know, to do just a less on the fastq.gz file, there's a small problem because it says, you know, it's a binary file. Do you want to see it anyway? And you'll get just a whole bunch of what seems to be random characters. If anyone can interpret that, well, kudos to you. You're in the matrix because I have no idea what any of this uh, really is, you know, staring at it this way. Uh, luckily, again, a little tidbit for anyone who's going to be doing this regularly, uh, there is a command called zless, which says, okay, I understand compressed files. And what I'll do is, if you just type zless in the name of the file you want to look at, you should be able, I'm going to show you the actual character uh, values that are, are stored in here. So now this looks should be looking a little more familiar. Starts with the at symbol. My apologies, the fact that it uh, line wraps, but I wanted to make it uh, large enough for you guys to see. Uh, but you can see that four lines represents um, one single sequence. And this looks a lot more familiar to us. Again, one of those little uh, tricks that I've seen so many of the former students that I've had in the past, actually uncompress the file, look at it, then recompress it. And uncompressing 4.9 gigs of a file, or sorry, uh, 1.5 gigs of a file to go to 4.9 is actually, it takes some time, really does. Uh, even on a current laptop, it takes a little bit. OK, we have just finished FASTQ files. Um, and I don't have a sense of kind of where you guys are at. So I want to open this up to both sections of FASTA and FASTQ if you guys have any questions for me. OK. Either it's too early in the morning, you guys are just ridiculously smart, or I'm bored. Actually, I have. Absolutely. What's your question? Uh, I never uh, wondered, but now it came to my mind why it's called FASTA and FASTQ. What's the name from? Good question. Um, I remember looking this up one time, and I didn't actually get a good reasoning for the actual name of it. I thought it was an acronym for something, but I was never able to find out uh, what that acronym was. I'm just doing a quick search again. Oh, OK. Um, the FASTQ portion is another the one Q I have no idea. Q is for quality, yes? I would have assumed it's for quality, but it's never been defined because ah, okay. they, they, they said that, you know, um, it's a FASTA file, but with some quality scores. Um, now, again, when it was used originally, uh, when Sanger originally intended it, um, I don't know if it was kind of um, built in mind with the um, Human Genome Project, uh, but they were doing Sanger-based sequencing, uh, and FASTA files were really the only means of which they were storing the sequences. But uh, for the FASTQ file, I would have assumed that as well, that the Q stands for quality. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I would have thought, OK, is it called FASTQ? Q? But who knows? So uh, there's some, you know, I'm, I'm willing to uh, step back if anyone has any other guesses of what those possibly are uh, or why they're called the way they are. But uh, otherwise, yeah, someone out there knows. I don't even know who, the, who created this. I have to ask someone at Sanger. I think there is um, like a software program called FASTQ. Uh, way back when, and they defined the file type to be called a FASTA file, and then the software kind of fell out of use, but the, the name stuck around for the file type. So why was the software called FASTA? <laughs> I'm looking at the Wikipedia page. <laughs> Who made that? Was that Dennis Sanger? Uh, David Lippman and William Pearson. Doesn't say Sanger. 
Oh, okay. Fast as pronounced fast A stands for fast all because it works with any alphabet. Um, I guess originally there was fast P and fast N for protein and nucleotide. nucleotide. Which, I mean, those are still being used, less so. Um, but remember how before I told you guys you can actually do these as actually stored as nucleotides um, or uh, amino acids. Um, that's where the fast P came into mind. Fast N, I remember, but we, it was one of those discussion points in a book and everyone said, ignore it, you're going to be dealing with fast uh, no, okay. or fast A. Excuse me. I, I have a question. Uh, sure. For the fast Q file, which range of Q and those quality scores are accepted? I mean, does it depend on the experiment that you're doing or it's just something fixed? So this is actually dependent. Um, the FASTQ files that you're typically going to encounter are machine uh, kind of driven. So we talk a lot about sequencing. Um, so for example, the Illumina sequencers, um, they, <clears throat> they used to start at only, uh, I think it was like character B uh, and then move up from there. Uh, but that kind of went against with what um, Sandra was doing with their sequencing. And they were using an offset of 33 instead of that 66, I think is what that B represents. Um, and so it was throwing things off. And so people were just like, okay, well, what is it uh, that I can, uh, what is it that I can do? Okay, well, they came in line finally and went to that same offset. So if I take a look at what that, uh, oops, I did not like that. Uh, sorry, I'm just looking back here to see what the character for, oh yeah, it's the exclamation mark. Sorry, I even said it. Um, so we can go down to as low as an exclamation mark. Um, and then height really, I don't know what the upper limit is on that one. So let me just share my screen again. Uh, I don't know what the upper uh, limit is. Most of them, I've again, I've never seen anything with a, hollow, a higher quality score of uh, 60. So if we take a look at that 60 and add 33 to that one, uh, then we're, we're dealing with a square bracket, the right square bracket. So that's probably the highest that you'll encounter there on that. Oh, it does not like me going back and forth on, on sharing and doing the slide. Okay. Can I ask, is, is there like a rule of thumb that, that the letters are good quality, but the numbers and characters are bad quality then or something like that? You know, it's funny you mentioned that. I asked that once when someone was calibrating our uh, machines. Um, and so that's really what it's boiling down to. So you're asking who monitors the quality of the qualities? Is that well, kind of like, your question? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I guess just looking, looking at that list, it's, it's hard to figure out like where the cutoff of what, what a, a decent quality is. But it seems to me that the letters are in the range of good qualities. But down at the, I think if I'm, unless I'm reversing it, that the numbers and the characters are not so good qualities. Oh, sorry. I see. So you're you're talking about from the uh, ASCII table itself. Yes. Uh, oh, sorry. Okay. I okay. I understand the question now. Um, so yeah, I mean, um, if you see a comma, for example, you know how far down the list that is. It's pretty down there. Um, so the, when you take a look at something like that, yeah, you can associate it that way. Um, it's funny. I don't even see them as actual legible characters anymore. I just see numbers whenever I look at these things. So, uh, but it's definitely a it's an interesting way of looking at it. So yes, I mean, you can take a look at it. Um, most of the time, if you see anything in the range of an A or an a B, you'd be like, mm, is that really good enough? Because again, you're, uh, the highest value that I usually see for most cases is gonna be a 60, um, which means it's one in a million. So that, I guess that gives you the spectrum of how far up that's gonna be. So I'll just chime in to say, usually when I take a peek at the data, 
you want to look at your data and get a sense of it, if it's good quality or not. You want to look for capital letters, right? If you see a, a bunch of capital letters, it's good. Um, depending how long your reads are, your quality can drop off at the end, or you might have a little bit of bad quality at the beginning. So you might, so you kind of want to see capital letters sort of in the middle chunk. And if you see a whole bunch of commas, something went wrong, or those reads are terrible for some reason. Um, but you really want to do some of the QC metrics um, that are going to come up in module three to look at how good your reads are. Um, lots of the algorithms for calling mutations will consider the quality of that base that supports the mutation um, and, and getting confidence of whether it's a real mutation or not. So they make a real big difference, but usually it'll be an algorithm that you use that will be looking at that quality. Although it, it is nice to look at your own data and see and see lots of um, of capital letters. So yeah, that's a good observation. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Um, by the way, there are so few people that look at raw data. Um, I highly recommend just open it up and take a peek. Um, it it costs you a couple seconds just to review it. And it also gives you some idea about familiarity. So that whole idea of using the quality scores uh, when you're doing your base calling as well as using the quality scores when you're doing your variant calling, not all algorithms actually look at it, which is the sad part. Portions, some of them do, some of them don't. They'll give you a variant call and you'll be like, well, I, you know, I kind of made some primers, it just did a cross, this is not showing up, what's going on here. Never hurts to look back and find out, you know, was that base actually correctly called? or was it marginally called? So these are the things you should take a look at. <clears throat> okay, any other questions? Um, I had a question. Um, between the FASTQ and FASTA files, so will the FASTQ files also have those IUPAC code names in them? And will those also have quality scores assigned? So I have never seen any IUPAC codes in a FASTQ file. Um, I've even taken a look at the standard itself and it doesn't say explicitly that it can't be in there, but I've never seen it in there. Good question. However, most of the time you're always going to just see an A, C, T, G, and an N, uh, at least from what I've encountered. I have a okay. question yes. about, oh, sorry, I have a question about the FASTA files. Yes, please. Uh, so are those updated regularly as more sequencing is done and some of those ends get discovered or some of the, uh, or like some of the areas of the genome that, you know, uh, do the better sequencing techniques become uncovered. So do they update these FASTA files? That is such a great question. The answer to that is depends. Worst answer I could possibly give, but yes, it depends. So, uh, do they update it? Yes. Sometimes you'll actually see prefixes to a uh, reference genome and see blah, 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 dot one or dot two. And it tells you that, you know, they're progressing and they're, they're actually figuring out uh, more bases that were once upon a time in, or they're fixing uh, positions, um, things like that. So are they updated regularly? Not like every day, mm -hmm. not even necessarily every month, but they do have a release cycle. Like, don't get me wrong, the GRCH uh, 37 was what, February 2009. Mm -hmm. GRCH 38, does anyone remember GRCH 38 when it came out? 2013, I think. Of 2013. Um, so you could see that, you know, there's that four year gap where there are updates in between. Sure. Here's the problem. If you do all your analysis on one version, say dot one, they come out with dot two, dot three, dot four on a kind of even say uh, quarterly basis. Mm -hmm. Are you going to redo all your files on that? So you're gonna have to reanalyze everything. This is, this is played literally all of us mm -hmm. for just like for years. And so while they do update them on a, on a, on a, on a basis, I can't even say a regular basis, um, even I think uh, Heather actually sent out a, um, uh, a Slack message once upon a time to our lab, uh, which talking about you know, the whole entire human genome reference is complete. Um, I'm not about to go back and redo the analysis on two years worth of pancreatic data, pancreatic cancer data. Um, and reanalyze those. That might, I just need to close this off. Maybe I'll take a look at it as part of phase two. Um, but even if they do update those on a semi-regular basis, it's kind of hard to keep up with that analysis. Just keep going over and over and over again. My highly, I highly recommend pick a reference from the beginning. Keep your eyes open because if there's a glaring problem in say, um, 
uh, if you look at Lee Romani, so TP53, um, say there's there was an error that got fixed kind of in TP53, whether it's a shift or something, uh, then by all means, go for it because it's directly impacting uh, your work. However, pick yourself a reference, pick yourself a fixed prefix on that reference, and then stick to that at least for the duration, unless there's a, a, a definitive reason why you shouldn't. I have to admit, I don't even know if longevity when the next reference genome is going to be made available uh, or even what's in the works in the, uh, uh, the genome reference consortium. So I have one last question. Sure, sure. Uh, so which, uh, which site would you recommend that, uh, that like maintains a pretty good up-to-date uh, FASTA file, like, I don't know, like USCS or Ensemble or where? You're about to start a rumble. That is such a lab specific thing. <laughs> Some people have their 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 preferences. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'll be honest with you. I have I have always been using UCSC mm -hmm. for no other reason than it was the one that was forced down my throat when I first started. Okay, that's it. Uh, there have been derivations of that particular reference genome uh, from other people where they'll give you you know the um, the 1 to 22 x y m then they'll give you additional sequences some will be called like junk sequences um for example they'll throw in uh, a couple of common uh, contamination sequences uh, that are on some benches so that you can eliminate those ones uh there'll be those you know those just random fragments of dna that they really couldn't figure out where they are but they know they're part of the human genome um, and so they'll stick those in there as well mm. uh, but ucsc has always been kind of my my go-to anytime i start a new uh Kind of a new place where we're, we're, we're dealing with with data but keep in mind that this is actually going to require some collaboration uh with whoever it is other labs that you're dealing with um if they have a fixed kind of uh, standard for which reference they use then you may not have a choice but to use it but um for me personally i've been always a big use of c fan thank you cool okay let's move on before we do kind of the next file format, though, I kind of get to give you guys just a little bit of background of just the idea of sequencing in general. Okay, so here, let's just say this is, you know, human DNA. I'm just going to stick with that for now. What I'm going to do is if I get a piece of DNA, uh, we don't sequence this kind of like from one to the end. Um, again, if you even just looking at chromosome one, that's 250 megabases. It's kind of a difficult thing to do. Uh, one time, if you're doing it sequentially. Uh, number two, um, just the sheer keep up of reagents as it's in the sequencing is going to require some kind of labor there. Uh, and three, it really is time. It takes such a long time to just kind of run through that. So what we'll do is um, they actually just share their DNA so that we have it to some length. Um, I've always found the whole shearing process fascinating because I think the first month that uh, I worked at OECR, uh, they let me in the wet lab and they let me uh, shear some DNA and really I pressed a button and that was it. That was just the most anticlimactic thing I'd ever encounter. But we'll get different fragments of DNA and what we can actually do with those ones, we can, if we sequence all these in parallel, well, we can get some information about them and that should reduce our timeframes a lot more. But the question is, so I just take that great little piece there. How do we actually, how does the sequencing portion actually work? I'm not going to get into details about the specifics behind Illumina sequencing, nanopore sequencing, or anything like that. This is just going to say that we have a piece of fragment of DNA. Uh, and again, I'll be dealing with DNA here. We have some mechanism. The DNA just runs through it. And what we'll do is we'll get a FASTQ file. I haven't talked anything about read lengths or anything along that lines. Just the fact that we're going to get a FASTQ file for that little segment of uh, DNA, which we're going to call a read. Um, that's kind of all you need to know. We know that four lines uh, make up that FASTQ file where we have the actual sequence and every corresponding base in that sequence has a quality score of some sorts. Okay, so that's one. We could just read through that entire DNA fragment. That's great. There is another technology that is probably one of the most common ones used. Um, this isn't taken away from any of the sequencing technologies, but this is the one that's just been used for, for you know, the better part of a decade uh, that seems to kind of taken over most things, where, again, we have that same fragment of DNA. We're going to attach it on some mechanism at one end of it. We are going to sequence up to a distance. So right now, we sequence, you know, 
certain number of bases, and then we're going to stop. We're going to attach on another mechanism on the other end. And what we're going to do is we are going to sequence from the other direction, and we're going to sequence in. So we are going to get from that one fragment of DNA kind of just the ends of it. This one we're just going to call uh, uh, read underscore r1.fastq, and then the other side we're going to call it read underscore r2.fastq. And really what we're doing is we're taking a pair of sequences uh, of that fragment. And you'll hear this term a lot, and maybe some of you have already heard of it. Uh, it's called paired end sequencing. Some people you know, may wonder, well, what happens to the middle portion that you actually didn't sequence? Which, that's a really good question. Here's the caveat. We're not just dealing with one uh, cell. We're, we're dealing with a, a bulk of cells. And so we're actually sequencing a whole bunch of these things. And if you take things looking in totality, you're probably going to cover that middle portion to some degree. Um, again, we, you'll hear the term coverage or depth of coverage a lot. And that's actually what this means for any one given position in your reference genome. How many reads or little fragments do we have piling up there that we can actually take a look as evidence for uh, what we're looking at? OK, so let's just go back and um, look at it from just a, a single cell here. Uh, or sorry, a single um, a piece of DNA. And what we'll do is we'll actually add some labels to these ones. So now, remember, we were talking before about how we're looking at on A, we're going to have one end of A, and we're going to have the other end of A. So this will be A underscore R1, A underscore R2 dot FASTQ. Keep in mind, though, that when you sequence something, it's not going to be this kind of sequential, pretty nice thing. It's kind of going to be all over the place. So you won't actually know the order of things. You won't necessarily know where these fragments are supposed to occur within that reference genome. So in this particular case, we were talking about chromosome 1. D is on chromosome 1 somewhere. I have no idea where. B is as well. I have no idea where. I got to figure out uh, where this thing matches up to, which this is going to actually lead us to the uh, SAM slash BAM format. You hear me call the SAM file from here on. Um, and we'll get to the reasons why uh, the BAM portion, I'm not really talking about it, even though it exists. Okay. So again, I like feeding you guys to the deep end or straight to the sharks. Here's what the actual file looks like when we're looking at the characters themselves. And again, as with almost all the files you're dealing with, there's a header to give us information. And then there is a whole bunch of data, uh, which gives us other information. Um, so let's kind of take a peek at what's going on here. <clears throat> the first line, uh, it actually starts with an ADHD, and, and it's probably hard to see, so I just kind of blew it up here. That HD actually tells us that this, uh, first off, that all headers in a SAM file start with that at symbol again. And now that we've confirmed that at, the, the way to say that at is literally just at. Um, so that at symbol uh, tells us that it's a header line. The HD gives us uh, tells us a specific information about um, the file itself. So the VN says that this is according to version specification 1.5. So the SAM slash BAM formats actually have specifications associated with them. Someone came up with the standard and said, all of you guys, if you're going to be using the SAM format to convey what alignments are, you're going to use this. And I have to tell you, before this SAM format came about, it was a crapshoot. Your data could be in so many different types of uh, alignment. Uh, there was a Mac one. There was other ones with Solid when they came up with their own. It was just, it was, it was absolutely crazy at times. Um, so yeah, so sorry, I'm kind of just not even doing my slides here, but uh, metal like a uh, header line. Ver, uh, version of the actual specification used. Geo is interesting. I never use this. I don't think I've seen it you know, set to anything other than none. Uh, this is just kind of my uh, experience with this. But uh, I always leave it here because it's usually put in there. Um, but again, I don't think I've ever set it to anything other than none. It's supposed to represent the grouping of alignments. Um, but it's kind of funny because I've never actually worked with that. The SO, however, that SO tag is very, 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 very important. It's one of those things where you can actually take a file, and we'll get to this momentarily, and you can sort it 
but how many different ways can you sort it? This actually tells you that it's just sort of, sorted by the, the genomic position. So it's sort of based on the chromosome as well as the position it itself. And we'll get to what all this means in a, in a moment. At SQ is kind of the next section in the header. And again, it was a little hard to see because it was so small. So I'm just going to uh, copy it here. So you're going to have in that header section a whole bunch of these at SQs. And what this represents is all the different reference names that were used. So you actually take a read when you align it to a reference genome of some sorts. Remember how we had that FASTA file, the multi, um, the multi sequence FASTA files? And they all started with that greater than symbol. Um, that SN says what the next some text, uh, quote unquote, that I used uh, beside that greater than symbol. So this tells you, okay, what, what is the actual, in this particular case, that first line, SN is one, it's chromosome one. How do I know that? Well, I actually aligned it and did that. Uh, and, and also we know what the length is of that particular sequence, uh, which is 200, approximately 250 megabases. Um, so yes, so the, the order of this is all important. Let me, you know, let me just get to back to the FASTA file that we were dealing with previously. If you remember this slide, how we did a quick wrap of um, the FASTA file that we were dealing with, we actually use these FASTA files in all our alignments, and you'll be dealing with this a lot more in module three. We deal with these, um, these CHRs, and you notice the corresponding values to those SNs. Well, those are a little bit different. Well, that just tells us that the FASTA file that they used actually had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's what they look like instead. Um, nothing overly special. Just keep in mind that, again, because there's no fixed format, this is really institute dependent. NCBI, um, UCSC, UCSC will always use CHR in front of theirs. NCBI, they, um, I believe they only use just a numeric value, um, you know, with the exception of being X, Y, and MT. So they'll just eliminate the CHR. Which is fine. I mean, you're just really carrying around three extra characters for no reason when you know what this is. Um, so keep in mind that the order of which you do your alignment in is going to be represented in this file as well, which is why I always say keep everything in kind of that numeric order. Regroup. If I told you that you're just not going to be sequencing one sample, but you're going to be sequencing a lot of samples, would anyone here really be surprised? No, I mean, I'd like to hope that you guys are doing a whole bunch of samples. And specifically, since it's cancer related, um, you're going to be looking at, uh, you know, tumor normals, you're going to be looking at multiple samples. The regroup itself, I'm going to kind of break this out a little bit easier. So a lot of the times when you see it as a single row of data, I'm going to break it down to columns just to make it easy for us to view, but it has the same data in there. This regroup section tells us some information about the sample that you just sequenced. Um, so anytime you see at RG in the, the beginning of that header section, it's always going to be a regroup. Okay. The important thing is the things that, that uh, correspond to it after the fact. Um, so ID, you got to have a unique identifier uh, for this particular uh, sample and library. Uh, it's just one of those things where you just need to identify it among all the craziness in there. SM is the actual sample name that it belongs to. This is kind of a little bit of a debatable thing. Uh, a sample name can be um, a person's name and their MRN, if you so choose. Please don't do that because that's illegal for privacy reasons. Um, most of the time, people come up with their naming conventions and will literally use sample one, sample two, sample three. I'll be honest, I've done it in the past. Uh, we actually came up with a more kind of standardized means of naming our samples. Um, but keep in mind that. Uh, you can easily do it that way. A library is, it's funny, with libraries, some people will actually use the library name and the sample name as being the exact same thing. What's a library compared to a sample? Does anyone know? Actually, I didn't even ask this question originally. How many people have actually started looking at sequencing data? Or raise your hands. Please, instructors, do not raise your hands. OK. NTAs, don't raise your hands. I know you guys. OK, so some of you guys have done it, uh, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, you get a sample, then what do you do with it? Someone shout out an answer. It's fine. You prep the library. 
prepped a library. That's exactly it. Well, I mean, um, some people actually give you tissue and then you have to extract your analyte, whether it's a DNA or an RNA, whatever the case may be. Uh, and then from that, you're going to actually have to prepare a library. And that library is very specific to the type of uh, sequencing that you're going to do on that one. Here's the thing, though. Uh, how many libraries can you pull out of a, a single sample? Really, there's really, you're only limited to by how much sample you have. That's all it is. You can reprep that library over and over and over again. And you'll want to know the different libraries that were created for each of those samples. Why? What happens if you have one particular library from that one sample that has all sorts of fusion genes all over the place? That's just absolutely crazy. And then one other library that has absolutely none of those. If you mix and match and don't define what those libraries are, you may be thinking to yourself, oh man, what's going on here? So it's really a way of just kind of separating these things. The next one we have is the platform unit. Now, platform unit, I'm going to actually tie this into uh, platform itself, which is a little bit further down the line. But fl platform unit, you need some form of identifier uh, to know exactly um, what this was sequenced with. And you know, saying the sequence with an Illumina machine, that doesn't mean anything you know, in terms of the time, in terms of um, the flow cell of which it was used. That's what we actually use. We'll actually stick the, the flow cell information in there. Um, or others would just actually choose a run name. So whatever the, the sequencer actually spits out, which with Illumina sequencing, it actually spits out the uh, flow cell as part of the run name. So that's actually one of the ones that we use. The CN says, okay, where was the sequence? Give me some information about them. And then the platform is just discussing what platform is used. This could be Illumina, this could be Oxford Nanopore, um, this could be 10 Genomics, you know, could be any one of those. You can have a whole bunch of RGs in one. I, the only, I don't put multiple samples into a single BAM file uh, because it confuses me when I have to de make some decisions when I call variants and things like that. Um, so I'd rather not. So what I do is I actually keep each individual sample separate. Now I can merge multiple libraries into one and that's something that we actually do very commonly. Um, so that's the only instance that I've ever had multiple RGs in. Um, if anyone has any other stories of where they use multiple RGs uh, in terms of the other instructors or TAs, uh, please jump in. Uh, but that's just, again, my experience here. Excuse me. Yes. Explain library uh, more, because I haven't been in VetLab ever, and I didn't understand the library itself. OK. Anyone here a wet lab person? No instructors, students only. Because I'm about to butcher this, and so if anyone wants to uh, jump in. Um, so a lot of the times what you're going to do is you're going to receive uh, a vial of, let's just we'll stick with DNA. It makes things a little bit easier. Uh, we get ourselves a, a vial of DNA, um, which was prepared by someone, extracted by someone. And we want to actually get some information about the DNA that's in here. So for us to get the sequence information out of there, we need to prepare what's called a library from that. And a library is a kind of a set of procedure. Well, there's a set of procedures that are followed uh, in order to um, kind of take your DNA and prepare it to be actually used inside the sequencer. So I'm skipping some steps here, trying to make it really simplistic. <laughs> when we uh, prepare that library, it is very, very, very specific to the instrument at hand. And once it actually gets put into that sequencer, we'll get the information out that we want. Here's the catch though. What happens if someone prepared that really, really, really badly? We're probably gonna get really bad data. Well, do you still wanna sequence that original library that was done? Probably not. The only caveat to this one is if you have very, 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 very small DNA amounts that they gave you, you might be stuck. In that case, good luck. Uh, something really bad happened and, and you, you, there's much bigger problems. If, however, you have like someone gave you, you know, five mils, it was great. I could work with that. Technically, I only need, you know, uh, nano or pico, depending on what I want to actually sequence. Um, 
But now I have the opportunity to say, okay, well, I'm going to go back to the original DNA that I had. I'm going to re-prepare that because it really didn't pass any of my quality metrics. So someone's doing it quite literally from scratch again. And then I'm actually going to take that and sequence that. And hopefully that one's much, much, much better. So hopefully no one screwed up. You get much better data. If you still get bad data, well, you start wondering what's going on with the DNA itself. Does that make sense? I, can I just add a little bit to that, which was great. Please. And I, I think um, when you think about libraries, like Richard said, they're for a specific purpose. So if you're doing whole genome sequencing, your DNA is gonna get fragmented into 350 base pair chunks. And then you put adapters on the end and those attach to the, uh, to the primers on the Illumina flow cell. You can't take that preparation of that library and do long read sequencing on it. You have to prepare your tissue DNA in a different way where you're now extracting super, super long pieces and you have different adapters and you can sequence that library on a packed bio machine. So you can't, so libraries are made for specific sequencers and for specific assays. And they can be DNA libraries or RNA libraries, et cetera. So it's, it's, a, it's just to get your material in, in the right form for sequencing. That's a great point, sir. Thank you so much for that because I didn't even talk about the different platforms. So. I'm sorry. So you can use the same library for like different experiments. It doesn't matter what experiments you're doing. Yeah, so if you had that library that you made for whole genome sequencing, where you're going to read, do paired end read sequencing, um, and you sequence that and you realize, oh, I need actually, I need more reads from this library because I'm looking for some rare things. You could just sequence more of that library. So if you have a good library, you could keep going back to that library and sequencing more of it. If you want to now do long read sequencing to complement that short read sequencing, you go back to your tissue, you make another library, and then you sequence that long library on a different instrument or a different platform. Good, thank you. So I have a question. Shoot. So when you sequence it for the second time, the same library, do you give different uh, LB names for that library? Well, that, that, one's, that one's the, if you're doing it just from the same lab, library, no, that, that library stays the same. There is a catch though that you will have a, you're most likely going to run it on a different, you can even be a different um, instrument. Um, it could be, it's going to be a different flow cell. And so you'll have different information based on that one. But for all intents and purposes, that library name is exactly the same as it once was, because you're just literally just taking an aliquot of that and sticking on a flow cell again, going through that process of putting adapters and so forth. All right, thank you. Does, does everyone understand? Once I mentioned why you would actually sequence that same library again, it's very important. I just the, the the whole idea of the more information that you get, the more data that you get, the better statistical power you're going to be able to make uh, with decisions. Um, and so we always talk about you know how deep do we go? I don't know about most people. Jump in if anyone is, uh, wants to say anything about this specifically. But for Illumina data, I've always done a 60-30 rule. So I'll always go, you know, at any one given location, 60 reads pile up in uh, one particular spot for the tumor. And then looking at normal tissue, I'll do 30 reads piling up at any one particular spot. Okay. I'm going to keep moving on here. So we had that PG line, which again, difficult for people to see, but I just broke it out again, and I'm going to break it out this way. The PG is really one of those interesting things. If I told you you can get a historical view on any program slash tool that was used to process a file, that would be great. I got an audit trick. Um, I just realized after saying that, that my view of great is really probably different from most people. But I get interested in it because I can go forward and backwards in terms of looking at data and figure out exactly how someone processed that. So that's where the at PG comes in. It comes in, um, multiple of them can, uh, can be done in a single SAM or BAM file. Uh, and the reason is you can do a lot of things post-processing. So you can take a SAM file, you can convert it to a BAM, you can take that BAM and you can you know, sort it, you can do that sorting and then resort it. So you can get this auto trail of exactly what that file has gone through. 
go through some of the tags here. ID is a unique program identifier. So I don't know about most people. I usually just give it a name of the actual uh, tool and then add a, uh, add a suffix to it, dot one, dot two, depending on how many times I've used that thing. Uh, but that's just me. The program name is the actual program you use. And in this particular case here, it's sand tools. Uh, you get to actually retain the version of the program use. And I cannot emphasize how important um, versions are when you're dealing with the data that you are. If you start changing versions in the middle of it, you may see some really weird things. So for example, if you have a thousand samples that you've processed, half of them were uh, played around with on version sand tools, say 0 0.9, and the other half were done on sand tools 1.3, and you see some huge discrepancy, like there's some batching that's happening there. Look back at the actual versions that were used because a lot of the times you're gonna notice that, that was actually the culprit. But the best part about this is if anyone wants, looking again at the audit trail, you can actually see the exact command that was used in order to uh, process the, the, the file that you're working with. So this is, this is great. Um, again, my definition of great really must be different from most people. Okay, so now that we've got the header portion out of the way, let's take a look at the data because this is where the real fun stuff happens. Um, you are going to be going over this a whole lot more detail um, with uh, module uh, three. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to go over this just so, to give you some familiarity. So this is a long file. It just, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's a tab separated file uh, that has a lot of information. And let's break some of the, the more important things down a piece at a time that you'll be dealing with. And the first columns that you work with is a Q name or a query name. <clears throat> the next one is going to be a flag. It's funny, there are a whole bunch of these things that I was writing out uh, like last week. And then I realized, you know, as much as I like having this information here, you guys can just read up on this. Let's actually apply this and figure out what's going on with each of these tags themselves. So I'm going to take this one, uh, the first line uh, uh, from a SAM file. We take this first line. And does it make sense to anyone? Anyone who's actually looked or not even looked at the data? It can be a little daunting, uh, but let's break it down. So I just, again, I just took the, the information and put it down into more column or format for us to look at. So that first line that's there, or, or the first tab stop, um, has this. It's a query name. Um, HiSeq9 tells me that it's probably a HiSeq machine, unless you're just playing with me. Uh, there's some numbers, don't know exactly what those are. Uh, and then there's some characters at the very end of it. And I wonder if that's a molecular barcode. Um, you know, it gives me some information. And this is actually going to be unique uh, for this particular uh, bit of sequence. The next one is a flag, flag 129. This quite literally means nothing to most people. I am going, and I put this on a separate slide here, this is probably the most important site you will ever encounter when looking at SAM slash BAM files. So the flag is this really weird way of reducing a whole lot of information into a single number. So this is what that, um, that, uh, that site looks like. And I can actually take that flag 129. Let's just take that one for example here. And I'm going to take that number and pop it into the text box here and then hit explain. And what it'll do is it'll put little check marks beside all the properties of this particular sequence. And this is fantastic. So the first thing that it actually uh, lists for me is the fact that this is uh, a paired read. OK, if it's a paired read, I'm most likely dealing with an Illumina sequence paired and run. OK, got some great information. Um, notice the other one that's uh, checkmarked there is the second in pair. So this is most likely that underscore R2 dot fastq, uh, or comes from that underscore R2, that other end uh, that we were dealing with in the, in, the, in the picture previously. OK, this is great. I've got a little bit of information about the sequence I looked at. I can actually do the reverse. This is just kind of a, a little side thing. If you ever want to, you can just randomly start clicking on things and it'll update the, the sand flag for you. It'll tell you what that number is. So an unmapped, if something's unmapped, it just gives you a four. Uh, if it's paired, you know, it, adds a, uh, it turns it into a five, so on and so forth. Sorry, for anyone who's kind of uh, into the, the math of this sort of thing, um, really it's just an execution of like binary bits. Uh, it's just, uh, sorry, bits that get turned on or off depending on what's there and then convert it to a decimal value for your ease of use. Okay, so 
uh, the, this, this is just some of the information about what's there. I'll be honest with you, while it's great to look at absolutely all of them, these are the ones I always focused in on, you know, is something paired, um, is something mapped or not mapped? If you're looking at paired end data, is the corresponding other end of that fragment that you're looking at, is that mapped or unmapped? Um, does this thing align to multiple locations on the reference genome? Um, if it's multiple mapped, it's always one of those questionable things that we look at. One of the other things is, you know, amongst the library preparation, when this thing was PCR'd, um, did we happen to sequence the exact same fragment and it's just one of the PCR duplicates? Um, and, and again, you have the ability to be able to flag that as well. So these are some of the things that I look at personally. Okay, RNA, the next one. This really is just the reference name. <laughs> uh, remember at the at SQs, uh, we had a listing of all the uh, chromosomes of which we had our uh, references aligned to. Well, this is it, or sorry, our sequences aligned to. Well, this is it. It just tells you that this aligns to chromosome one. Um, subsequently, uh, this gives us the uh, position uh, on chromosome one. Uh, the next one here is the map Q, so the, the qual um, map quality. This is no different from your FRED score. Uh, keep in mind that with your FRED scores from your, uh, from your base quality. Can anyone tell me what a zero means? That it's probably correct, uh, that we have zero uh, to low confidence that the alignment that was listed as chromosome one position 138,017 is probably the correct one. The cigar string, and I know that I'm kind of going through this a little quickly. The only reason being is you actually cover this in some good detail in the next module. I just wanted to kind of give you kind of a small introduction so that when you see it in a little more detail, that'll get it reinforced for you. Uh, for the map queue, is it the average across all of the qualities of the base of that sequence? Um, this is the mapping quality. So it's not- Oh, okay, so it's overall. Yeah. It's not yes, per it's base. Overall, yeah. So it says, okay. if I have the sequence length of say 100 bases, if I were to actually line that up into chromosome one, position 138017, does it actually match up well? Yes or no? And it goes through some beautiful math to say, okay, this really doesn't align here well, but it also doesn't align anywhere else well. Uh, the cigar string is probably one of my favorite things. Uh, which again, you go over with in, in greater detail. But this particular one says, okay, well, I have 98 bases in here in this sequence. Now, 98, it can either match or not match. I won't tell you any more than that. You'll have to actually look at the sequence itself to determine that. Um, but this gives you just a kind of a quick synopsis of what le read link you're dealing with uh, and, and also what the contents of it potentially are. The next two, when you talk about, uh, oh, sorry, before we get to that, if I actually take this Q name, if I actually take this sequence here and this quality, does anyone kind of wonder what's going on here with these three? If I kind of isolate these, I'm kind of just jumping ahead of myself, but I didn't want to forget this. Um, if I just take this, put an at symbol there, if I take the sequence, if I put a plus sign here and I actually take the quality scores, what does this look like? Anyone? Fast yeah, it's Q. a fast Q. It's a fast Q. It's great. Um, so I can act, this actually comes directly from the FASTQ information and then it just tags on some more details. Just be aware that you can go back and forth from a band to a FASTQ. Uh, it's much easier to go from the BAM or SAM to the FASTQ because you just need to kind of uh, slough off some columns and then uh, reorganize them. Um, so go from a FASTQ to a SAM file requires a separate tool. I just kind of wanted to uh, bring that up to you guys. Um, the Sequence align, uh, the SAM actually stands for sequence alignment map, which is something I didn't actually tell you in the very beginning. Um, and so the, the format itself, it gives you the information about where the sequences that you've been thrown at, where they align to on that reference genome. Contains two sections, a header section and a data section. Um, you have uh, lines to start with an at symbol to represent the header. Uh, and then again, we have the SD, SQ, RGPG, um, but then you actually get the data itself. So the data contains information about where those sequences align to. And we've gone through some of the different tags in there, uh, at least quickly to describe, you know, what information is found in there. Um, also just, you know, there's paired ends, there's single fragments, 
um, just be aware that those are the different types. Now with the BAM file, similar in nature to that Dutch EZ that we talked about, a SAM file can be huge. It can be in the order of about a terabyte for a single tumor of what I've encountered. And when it's compressed, it goes down to about 200 gigs. So it's a pretty big file. Um, BAM file, again, is just that compressed version. Keep your BAM files, ditch your SAM files. Rule of thumb. Uh, you'll be doing a lot more with it. So you can't just Z less a BAM file. You'll have to use specific tools designed for it. And again, you'll be using these tools in module three, one of them specifically is SAM tools. Uh, I'm just throwing it down here because uh, again, if depending on uh, how much time you have, you'll be actually doing some laboratory work uh, or some labs uh, with that. If anyone's interested, you can actually just take a look at that specification, which is found in um, online. Um, I put the link there for you so you guys can take a look. And does anyone have any questions about SAM BAM files? We have three more file formats. Uh, one called the variant call format, two other ones, which I mean, we'll go through really, really, really quickly because I'm kind of running out of time here. Um, actually, question for you is, Rashad? Yes. Is uh, Trevor going to be taking over my previous slot or no? Can I just continue? I think you should just continue. Okay, cool. Sorry everyone, my time is being thrown off here. Okay, so, sorry, questions, yes, anyone, anyone? There's a lot of information. I kind of threw a lot of it at you uh, in hopes for, again, just introduction and you will get to look at this in a great more detail in module three um, so that you'll actually be working hands-on with this data. Like a question? Sure. So, uh, so uh, I think I got some answer in the Slack channel, but I mean, when you create these SAM files, uh, if, if you do the library uh, sequencing twice, I mean, do you need to add these uh, names by yourself? Uh, if Let's say if you do, if you sequence uh, the same library twice, and if you want to distinguish these two and using the read name, so do you need to do that by yourself or is there a way uh, when the SAM file creates it, will do it for you or something like that? So this is probably getting into a little bit of module three. Okay, sorry. There is, well, well I'll, I'll answer your question now. So unfortunately, the tool that you're using has no idea about the library or anything. You have to fill that information yourself. So when you're executing the command, um, for example, there's a tool called BWA. Um, you can actually fill in that uh, regroup information by saying uh, there's a parameter for it to fill that in. And you'll literally call it LB colon and then add whatever name you so choose. The thing is that has to be manually done by you. Could you write a script to do this for you? By all means, go nuts on it. But be aware that the, the tool itself that does the aligner doesn't necessarily know anything about the libraries. That is, the onus is up to you to be able to li uh, label those. Which kind of makes sense because would you necessarily feel comfortable about just giving it a file, not giving it any information about what the library is? No, you probably want to tell it. OK, so the sequencing center would not give me any information of that, right? I'm not, other than well, they would say that. Sorry, the sequencing center, that's a different story. If you just say, for example, you just give um, tissue or so, say even a vial of DNA uh, to a sequencing center and say, okay, I need this thing to be sequenced. When they return that, most likely they'll have their own internal naming for libraries and they will identify that. And you'll be able, you should be able to see that inside your, um, your, SAM, header, uh, your SAM header sections. Um, but then again, you, a lot of the times, for example, someone will tell me, Richard, I need this thing sequenced to 60X coverage. Okay, the first pass I do, okay, I only get like 20X. I gotta keep doing that library again. When I do the library the second time, um, well, it really is still that just same 20X. There's really no difference, is it? You know, the, the library itself is considered to be not that complex. I'll have to redo another library. When I redo that library, I will give it a different name because it is a different, library. Uh, and then I will actually return that information 
to whoever asked us to sequence it saying, okay, we did this, there's multiple libraries in there for that one sample, here you go. Okay, so if, if they only give me the FASTQ file, that information is not there, right? If they only give you FASTQ, that is correct. That is not there at all. Okay. Hi, Richard. Um, Hi. I, I, have a, I have a question about, yeah, just along those lines. Um, yeah, I had I had a problem when I was marking uh, duplicates using the PCAR tool and it it wanted the uh, regroup information and then like I had to go into my ASQ file to look for it. And not all of these um all of these all of this information was available. So what would you recommend in that situation? Oh this gets this becomes a street fight for a lot of people because that's happened to me in the past where I've had uh, thing sequence, they've given me the raw FASTQ files, and they didn't tell me that the actual uh, sequencing was done of two different libraries. Um, if they don't tell you that, uh, what you'll end up doing is the following. If it's two different libraries, um, if they're two different libraries, you don't know that they're two different libraries, and there happens to be overlap of the exact uh, beginning and end of that fragment, you're going to collapse that down, and so it's going to be considered PCR duplicate. You can't win if they don't. If they give you the FASTQ files and they don't tell you that it's multiple libraries, you have no other choice but to assume that it's only one library. If you find again, this may be a point where did you ask them to specifically uh, set a coverage cutoff that it has to be minimum, like say forty x coverage. If you didn't do that. Um, you might want to talk to them and, and, and you know, tell them, well, this is, this is what I was actually aiming for. What coverage did you kind of give it to it as? Sometimes they won't actually just do the alignment. They'll just say, okay, I'm just going to do the sequence and generate the FASTQ files, and then you go deal with it. But then at that point, they're going to, tell, they're going to need to tell you that they've done it as multiple libraries or not. So that the onus goes to them. Um, and that's pretty much the only advice I can give you in terms of discussing it with them, because otherwise it really is a crapshoot. So I, I definitely feel your pain because I've encountered that as well. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my next question is about the the PG group. You mentioned about you mentioned the VN, which is the version of the program used, and that can result in some batch effects. Mm -hmm. um, so, how do you recommend addressing that? And like, do we address that in the analysis part, or do we ever address that? So, there's two parts of this one. Again, um, it depends on what you've been given. If someone there are some groups set up so that they'll just give you the band file. We did the analysis for you. Here you go. Um, and you can see that there's um, different versions being used. Right at that point, I always ask them, give me the raw data, let me do this myself. That's just me, it just happens the way I work. Um, if not, you could always go back to them because this has always happened, this has ha also happened at one of the production labs that I worked at where they had to actually process it using the exact same version. And usually that's a discussion point. What version do you want us to use? You have to tell us. If it tells what program, what version, we will, those are usually set up in kind of the agreement portion of things. So if you don't set up uh, originally, get yourself the original raw excuse and just do it yourself. Assuming, you know, assuming you have the computational power to do it, uh, if not, you become a little bit at the mercy of whatever uh, analysis group uh, inside that sequencing center did. Thank you, Richard. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I'll just, I'll just add to that. Richard, you showed that the FASTQ info is actually in the BAM file, right? So if you can't get the original FASTQs, often you can use a program called BAM to FASTQ and re-extract all the reads and then do your own alignment. Um, and there's only one caveat, which is that sometimes, um, and you can see this in the program in the PG, um, sometimes the parameters for alignment used make it such that they don't report, let's say, unaligned reads then the FASTQ that you extracted would not match the original FASTQ. So you just have to be aware of these, um, of exactly what was done to generate that file, but you can usually regenerate the FASTQ. Thank you, awesome. That's actually a really good point. Thanks for that, Fernand. Okay, I'm gonna move on to uh, VCF, which again is one of those uh, other important files. And again, as usual, let's just stick in the deep end and throw what a fast or the VCF file looks like. Hey, big surprise, we have a header and we have some data. Now that you're gonna probably say this is like a recurring theme, sorry about it, it's just the way that it works. 
Uh, let's go ahead and isolate some of these. So I'm just going to take that. Uh, I'm actually going to start with the data this time because this is where things get a little more interesting. You kind of have to work in reverse order for this particular one. So the data itself, it's a the data portion is a tab separated uh, section. Uh, I'm going to break it down into first uh, that first line. So this is the the header for the data section. It starts with a, a single. Do people still say pound? Because uh, I do. Most people these days, especially with the grad students I work with, keep calling it a hashtag and it freaks me out. Um, but um, if you hear me say pound. I think pound, pound, thank you. pound it is, I think, yes. But you may have just dated yourself, <laughs> just saying, okay? Um, so just it's, want to possible. Bring that it's possible, it's possible, it's <laughs> possible. Come on, Francis, come on. Um, so I still say pound, uh, you can interpret that however you you're want. You're old, you're old too, yes. Okay, so here's a little aside. You guys are at one point in time, you know, when I first started OICR and Francis remember this, I was like one of the youngest people in the lab. Now when I came back, I'm like the oldest person there. It's freaking me out. Okay, that's an aside. Um, so this particular one here that we're gonna look at, chromosome, this happens to be on chromosome nine. The position happens to be at, uh, I have to look at this, 130, me uh, 130 uh, megabases uh, from the start. So that's the position itself. The ID, this is just a dot. And a lot of the times you don't necessarily have to include what the ID for this particular thing is. And I guess I should have told you beforehand, I have it in my notes, but I didn't say it. This is a variant call format. So the purpose of this file is to store variants, uh, variant information. That means that you've done this alignment, you've taken your reads, you've put them up to the reference genome. And for the most part, a lot of it's gonna align exact. That is probably the most boring thing you will ever deal with. Things that are exact have no interest to me, at least uh, when I'm when I'm taking a look at from a cancer perspective. I think I care about that's things. Why, that's why you different. work. That's why you work. In, that's why you work in cancer because you like variants. It's exactly what it is. I like things that differ. Things that differ. That's what's interesting. Uh, because if it wasn't different, then I probably wouldn't care so much. Um, so this is going to tell us what chromosome uh, uh, for the particular uh, base that we're looking at, uh, what chromosome is it on, what position it's located. There is not necessarily going to be an, an ID. I have to be perfectly honest with you. I've always seen it as dots, but it's not necessarily the case. Uh, what we'll do is it'll actually tell us from the reference genome what that reference base is at position 132, 170, 50. It's actually a C. And it'll tell us in your read, however, that position is a G. OK, that just turned a little bit sexier. Um, we'll also get information about uh, quality for that variant. Again, you'll always see a quality. Uh, but again, the, the quality itself isn't necessarily filled in depending on the tool that you're using. Um, this particular one, I believe, comes, with, comes from a tool called Varscan. Um, and then you'll get some filter, and, and this one says, well, it passes like kind of all of our internal checks on this one. Here's where things kind of get sucky. You'll get this info string. Uh, which has a whole bunch of characters in there. You'll also get this format string, and then you'll get this normal kind of tumor thing. And, and we'll get to those in a bit, but let's start off by going back to the original file. Remember how I said that there is a header? Well, let's just actually extract that header and take a peek. Here's the data. Let's go back to the info string. And I put, whenever you look at the, the header file, you're gonna notice that some of them actually start with info. Uh, so pound, pound, info. And this is actually going to be kind of a description of the information in the info string. Okay. So for example, let's take a look at that DP equals 83. If I take a look inside that header, I'm going to notice info equals and the ID is DP. Uh, and then it's going to give us some description. This is going to tell us the total depth of quality bases. Uh, that's a little misleading. I wouldn't necessarily use the word quality. I just would just use the term bases. Um, but this is the total number of bases that kind of pile up at that one position. So you basically have 83 pieces of inf or pieces of evidence uh, for that particular variant that you're looking at. If this thing happened to be a uh, somatic mutation, sometimes you'll see the word somatic thrown in there. Uh, that's if it's calling somatic mutations. Otherwise, you won't necessarily even see this line in general because maybe you're looking at germline information. Uh, so you're just doing it against the reference genome and only the reference genome and not caring about tumors and normal values. Here, you'll actually get some more information. Uh, so for example, for Varscan, you'll have the, the status of it. So what's the somatic status of this thing? And you'll notice here that uh, 
in our particular case, SS is equal to three. And if we look that up, um, it's uh, a loss of heterozygosity. Okay, well, I'll keep that in mind uh, as I'm doing that. The next portion here is you're going to get some kind of quality score, um, what that is for this particular variant. And again, we know what the FRED scale is. This is the third iteration of us seeing uh, that uh, FRED scale, but applied to something different, but it's, its calculations are still pretty much the same. Um, depending on the tool you're using, they'll actually give you some stats. Um, so, I mean, in this particular case with the, with the alignment for the tumor in the normal, you'll actually get a p-value associated with that one. Um, this, again, is going to be very, very, very tool specific. Um, and again, it's going to be covered a lot more. I believe this is module four for variant analysis. Uh, but again, I'm just ex explaining to you that if you do get yourself a VCF file, don't be worried about these info strings because you can actually look that information up, at least for what it means, not necessarily how it's calculated. And then the last portion here, they're just going to tell us it's another uh, Fisher test um, looking at uh, tumor normal. Um, so you can do that comparison. So this, again, this really isn't to be specific here for exactly what, because you may not necessarily get a GPV, SPV, or even a DP uh, or SS in your VCF. This is very, very, very tool specific, but when you see that info string, you can always go back to the header and find out exactly what those components are. Okay, this is where stuff gets really fun. Uh, the format string. So I pulled up the format and you can see that at the top now. This is gonna tell you information about the variant calls themselves. So, I mean, technically speaking, you know that the reference call there was a C and the alternate call was a G, but this is only up to the reference genome. In a VCF file, because we're all, the majority of us are at least are doing cancer, we can actually compare the tumor to the normal. That's where things get fun. Um, so in this particular case, you can look it up and see what's GT. Well, GT is a genotype. You have the genotype quality, you have a read depth, you have the alternate, uh, alternate depths. Um, all that information is there. I leave it to you to look at it. But let's just actually take uh, uh, them kind of one by one along with the tumor and the normal. That genotype, most people are kind of used to the AA, AB, AB, or sorry, AA, AB, BA, BB. Um, anyone looking at arrays that's probably a little more familiar. We're going to change things up a little bit uh, where we're actually going to kind of give them um, some numeric values. So zero is typically going to be representative, saying that it's the reference space. One is going to be, okay, well, it's the alternate. So you have both alleles, you have one that's a, a C and then one that's a, a G. In the tumor, you have one and one, which means that you actually have uh, both alleles being uh, G and G. Okay, that's interesting. Right away, you can tell, well, there's probably a lot of heterozygosity. Is that a safe assumption, everyone? Probably a safe assumption. Okay. So if we kind of shift along uh, the quality, eh, Farskin didn't give us the quality score for this one. So we can just keep moving on to the different values. So it happens to be that the depth of coverage uh, that we get in the tumor in the normal, so we have 42 and 41, we have some pretty good evidence there depending on what your thresholds are. Now keep in mind, make sure that you do have a threshold cutoff. Whenever you go and do your sequencing, you need to tell them what your expectations are. My expectations a lot of the time are a 60 read depth. I'm only getting a 41 here. Is that sufficient for me? No. Am I willing to accept it? Maybe. Can they prepare another library and sequence it? Yeah. Okay, let's see if we can get that. And hopefully they don't charge me, which is why you said it, those expectations up front. <clears throat> uh, so you can actually, uh, um, you can get the number of reads that support it from the reference as well as from the alternate. So you can actually break those down. Um, these particular ones, the, the variant allele frequency, which so many people kind of manually calculate um, on their own. Some tools will just actually calculate it for you. Not all tools, unfortunately, uh, but a good portion nowadays do that calculation for you. And again, this one here, this is actually seems to be very, very specific with a uh, uh, VAR scanner, at least tool dependent, where you can actually get counts of saying what uh, directionality of, of some of the calls that you're getting. Uh, if it's on the reverse strand, forward strand, um, and then also whether it's the, uh, uh, the re uh, reference allele or the alt allele. Okay, 
Um, Richard, I have a question yes. here. Um, <laughs> so when we're looking at the frequency, does that mean like 75% of the sample is tumor sample? Yes. So, since it's a mixed sample, so then 45%. Oh, but why isn't it adding? Oh, it is adding 200%. All right. How does the tool know that which one is normal and which one is tumor? You tell it. Okay. All right. You have to tell it which is tumor, which is normal. All right. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Very call format. Again, this is just a summary. Um, just be aware that you are going to be covering this a lot more detail in uh, module four, um, which, which is great because you have to be doing this a little more hands-on. Uh, also, there of course is a specification on these ones. Um, I put the link there. You guys can actually take a look at the VCS specifications. These ones are relatively fixed for longer periods of time. Um, once upon a time, they're a lot more chaotic, um, but I highly recommend uh, if you guys actually want to take a look at more details uh, of the VCF, because I actually only went through a, kind of a portion of it in detail, um, take a look at that one. It's the, not exactly the most fun thing to read, but uh, it is something that you can do. Questions? Okay. Two more file formats I'm going to go really quickly through. We're going to do some database work. There's a question. There's a question in Slack for you, Richard. Um, oh, sure. Do, do the RD and AD numbers add up to DP for tumor samples? Uh, the, the reason I'm going to go back and, and say, uh, look and say yes or no is because it depends. And I hate saying that, but it really does. So um, in our particular case, uh, you'll see RD and AD here. Uh, what is that, 42? Uh, here it's 40, so there's one missing. There's a caveat to all of this. The read depth itself is usually just the total number of reads that support this particular location. Anytime you get to the RD and the AD, here's the problem. They actually go down and do a filter check for you. They say, I'm going to take a look at all these bases. Uh, so for example, let's take a look at the, uh, the normal one and takes a look at the 42 and it says, okay, 42 pieces of information here. Uh, actually, let's take the tumor, sorry. Uh, there's 41 pieces of information here. Uh, only 40 of them pass our quality filters. It's an internal thing. And so they're like, okay, we're only going to give you the counts for the depth supporting the reference, uh, the RD and the AD um, for those that pass our quality. Again, they don't tell you this and you, never, you won't necessarily see that until you look at that data and say, why don't these things add up? And then you go down to the documentation and you realize, okay, that 41 is unfiltered, the 10 and the 30 is filtered. How do I know this? I broke my head against the table trying to figure this out when GATK first came out because they did that. And they were, they were so notorious for that. This is the slam them. I love the Broad Institute, but boy, you did not make that clear in your documentation. So be aware that those numbers won't necessarily add up and always take a look at your data and then go back into the documentation for your variant calls. Yeah, and I'll just add to that. Uh, it's buried in like the default parameter somewhere, oh, right? No. So like when you when you run Varscan or Mutech 2 or whatever, they have default parameters and they're not obvious. You have to look at the documentation. Um, you can change them if you want. But usually these reads are filtered so that they exclude the reads that have those mapping quality of zero, right? The aligner isn't really sure that that read goes there. So why would you use it for variant calling? So it gets thrown out. Um, if you have a read where the base quality is really bad, so it's not sure it's actually that base, you don't want to consider that base for mutation calling. So it gets thrown out. So you have your read depth and then minus all these reads that didn't pass those filters. And you can change the parameters of how to control what, what you're comfortable with, including or excluding. Um, so yeah, you typically end up with much less than, like I, I've sometimes seen it be half in certain positions, right? Only half the reads are used. It really depends where you are in the genome. Yeah, I've, I, can, I can say that I've encountered that where it's down to like half or even a quarter, the, uh, the, the one that you're expecting. Yeah. That, did that answer your question? Can I ask a, quick, a separate quick question? So, so the the normal, 
you see normal re reference reads in the tumor sample, but it's called LOH. So presumably those are just from normal stromal cells in the in the sample or something. Like yeah, there's some threshold. We're gonna talk about this in detail in module four. Okay. We're gonna go over loss of heterozygosity. But heterozygosity, so this position in the genome, it's a it's like a variant position where you inherit one allele from your dad, one from your mom, right? You got a C and yeah. a G. So you should have in your DNA, 50% of reads having the C and 50% of reads having the G, which is what you see in the normal sample from this person. It's probably blood, right? You see 45% ratio between the two alleles. And in the tumor, you see a skew away from that. So something has happened. There's way more of one than the other. So there's probably a copy number event or something that happens. So you've lost the heterozygosity, which just means a 50-50 ratio. So okay. we'll talk, we'll talk lots about that in module four. Sounds good. Thanks. Okay. Okay, let me move on to bed and then GFF and then quickly go over the databases. Um, how am I doing on time? Because I'm really lost right now. Uh, I was only supposed to talk till 12.30, but start at 10.45. So I've yes, gone way so over that. You have time to finish this. OK, so I'll, uh, I'll finish uh, this section here, and, and we'll go from there. OK, bed file. Um, this one is very, very, very important. Um, I actually grabbed this from a exon, um, an exome capture file from Illumina. Um, it's such a simple thing though, because really all it is is give me a chromosome, give me a start position, and give me an end position. So if I'm ever trying to look at a, a, a file and I want to be able to record kind of regions of interest to me, I can go ahead and just store it in a bed file. There are a lot more columns uh, that are associated with this one, some of them for visual purposes, others to identify, for example, what strand is it on. Um, for this purpose here, Illumina gave us Kind of a main uh, to say where it's located. Some people will actually start information like gene information, um, so genes of interest uh, or even segments of, of gene. So it's really just boiling down to what regions of interest do I have? <clears throat> Nothing all that special. Sounds for the <laughs> browsable extensible data. It's funny because I remember when this, this format first came out, um, we were using it for gbrowse, uh, at least when I was uh, first using it. And um, just kind of putting some visuals up for people to be able to see some of their data. It's tab separated, it's text file. Um, each line represents one single region. Um, again, I only look at those three uh, mandatory fields, the, the chromosome, the start and the end position. The other ones, there's like nine additional columns. Go crazy on which ones you wanna use. Um, I've given some information here. Uh, I'll have some links also uh, to describe exactly what those are. Uh, let's talk about GFF really quickly. Oh, sorry, just to go back here, the only reason I'm showcasing this, this actually becomes very useful. There's a, a tool that you'll I believe one of the modules you'll actually use called Bed Tools, uh, where you can actually take your BAM file. And if there's only certain areas of interest for you, you can go ahead and just grab those areas uh, using Bed Tools. It, it's a lot more fun than you think it is. Um, or maybe again, my definition of fun is odd to some people. Um, but on the flip side of that one, I told you before that uh, this was from an exome capture. Um, so because you're only doing certain segments of uh, DNA in uh, in your sequencing, having all the rest is, you know, it's great, but does it really give you any information? So you'll want to take a look at ones that were actually specifically captured. Not to say that the uh, non-specific captures that you get, something may be interesting in there. Uh, but most of the time, you'll just be dealing with uh, just those regions that they give you. GFF, how many people here are interested in RNA? In my hand. Uh, this format is a typical format used um, for annotating, uh, which, you know, it's one of those great things that you're gonna be dealing with. So I grabbed this. Um, let me get this from. I think I grabbed this. Oh, I grabbed it from GenCode. Um, let's, I'm going to isolate um, my favorite gene, which is TP53. Again, I told you to study the Um So let's just take this and break it down a little bit. So I've just columnized it again. Um, again, happens to be on chromosome 17. Uh, the source of it is Havana, which I found out stands for Human Invertebrate Analysis and Annotation. I always wondered what that was. Um, but there you go. So that's the actual source. 
uh, for that. Uh, the feature is this particular location I'm looking at, it's Exxon. Uh, the start is there, that's the start position, that's the end position. Um, score, I don't really use that. Strand, this is on the negative strand, which makes sense because uh, TP53 is on the negative strand. Where we get to some more interesting information is the annotations that I was telling you about. So let's take a look first here at that group section and we'll take a look at that ID. Uh, excellent, so it's actually gonna give you uh, some transcript information about the source. It's gonna give you a parent transcript if there is uh, a parent to it. Uh, it's actually gonna give you, and, and sorry, the transcript ID and this particular uh, uh, gene ID, these are from Ensemble. Um, so not many people really like um, this kind of gene naming convention, but you can't always go back and forth just by going onto Ensemble's database and, and looking at that. You can get the exact transcript ID for this one, um, get some more information. This is where, I mean, most people feel a little more comfortable. It is TP53. Um, so you get the Hugo gene ID in there as well. Um, and again, this is something that I just downloaded, um, which you will be using uh, for a lot of your annotations, not necessarily just for uh, gene expression, but also for your variant calls themselves to find out where they're whether they're located in a gene or not. General feature format, it's a text file, it's a tab separator file, identify some features. Okay, you'll be using it a lot. Are you good on that? Sorry, I ran through those two really quickly just because I'm trying to finish this off. Um, but the, the ones that I really, really, really wanted uh, you to get more introductions on were the FASTA, which not many people are really gonna be talking about in this, FASTQ, and then again, the SAM and the EBCF, which are the real key important ones. Okay, let's talk databases. Um, I am such a big fan of the ICGC, not because I put the first uh, pancreatic cancer data up there. Uh, I did, <laughs> uh, so that's my claim to fame. Um, and also the first prostate data I think I put up there. But um, their website is phenomenal. I really wish I would have had this 13 years ago. Um, so I can actually go up here and it's a, a repository where, you know, people are now comfortable uploading their data and making it just completely available for people to use. What's more important is from us, from a cancer perspective, um, privacy issues concerning germline. I completely agree and understand what's going on there, but just give us the somatic information. Let, tell us what's different between the tumor and the normal. Um, a couple of caveats, uh, how many people are doing kind of somatic analysis? Uh, raise your hands. Um, the one thing that uh, I, I always ask people when you guys do your somatic analysis, the majority of us are using blood uh, for our normals. Uh, be aware, always ask them what the source is because I've had some adjacent normal. The problem is the, the, the margins were so small that there was so much tumor uh, contaminating into the, uh, into the normal that uh, it just threw off all my analysis. This is just kind of a little tip if, you know, always confirm what your normal is uh, ahead of time. Um, again, I'm gonna throw in my favorite, my favorite chain, TP53. Um, who doesn't like TP53 as a tumor suppressor? Um, and I can actually get a lot of information about that. Again, this is just, someone did all this work for you and you can just look all this stuff up. It literally gives you everything from, you know, where it's located, descriptions of it, all the different external references the fact that they give you, you know, all ensemble, entrees, everything. And then on top of that, you know, you find out how many mutations in there, which are clinically significant. And then to top it all off, they actually give you pathway analysis for you, which, I mean, Robin, I know he's done quite a, quite a lot of work uh, with rectum and, and I, like, this is just given to you. Someone had the foresight into saying that we're tired of all the researchers having problems being able to look up their data in, in a more cohesive manner. We're just gonna do that for you. So now you just have to take you know, what uh, gene or variant of choice and have to just plot it in and see who, how many other uh, different, material, uh, different cancer types are affected. Which so, is why you just click on, yes. I was just gonna say, Artres is actually pronounced Artres. And uh, it's a French word. And um, uh, and that data is actually from the great work of the folks at OICR who basically do have APIs to all these databases that you mentioned. That's how they populate their database. And just a comment that I see uh, someone raising um, his hand. Please, uh, we are a little bit ahead of time. So if you have any question, go on Slack. I'm with him there. 
and we will try to finish with the content. And if anything, we will answer you on Slack. And then Francis will stop interrupting Richard as well. <laughs> at least Sorry. for the at least for the French pronunciation of things. So. Oh uh, no! What's anyway? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Okay. Um, so what's great now is you know there's a, a mutations tab. Oops, sorry, there's a mutations tab that you can click on, and now you can actually start going a little more fine grained and taking a look at the different mutations. Again, look, I can go here and pick a primary set, pick a primary tumor. You know, go go nuts. Now it doesn't necessarily have all the different subtypes in here, and if you do want to look at the particular subtypes. Um, you'll, you'll probably need to take a look at the projects themselves, which will define those. So it takes a little more digging. But the sheer fact that I can just go on and click on brain and then see the local gliomas, the glioblastoma multiforms, this, this is just going to kind of enhance some of the analysis that you're going to be doing. And again, this is all boiling down to look at your data. Um, you have tools now available to you to be able to find out, okay, across how many different uh, cancer types uh, for uh, uh, for brain cancers are, are going to have a particular mutation of interest for me. And then on, on sorry, and then on uh, top of that, I can actually see the number of patients that we have uh, or donors that we have with uh, that particular mutation. And then how many mutations are there? The, these are these are things that now that people are just giving to you for free. You don't have to pay a single cent. And I really have no idea how sometimes OSCR makes their money because they're not charging for this. But man, this is fun. OK. Uh, Cosmic, this is another thing that I pretty much, I use Cosmic so regularly. I don't necessarily use the web interface as much because I'm a command line kind of guy. Uh, but the cancer gene census, this is kind of like some curated genes. Um, and the great part about it, this is wonderful, you can actually go down and take a peek at the somatic types associated with particular mutations. You could see the role in cancer. And if there's a particular fusion, you can find out what the corresponding partner fusion is. Like, again, they're just literally just giving this to you. Um, C Bioportal is another one. And Trevor is, he was, uh, he's kind of one of the developers for this. Uh, I, I did some work with him uh, in uh, accessing the C Bioportal API. This is another one where I can just pull information. What I really use this for is when I take a look at studies. Um, this has a, a great chance, you can see here that they have pan cancer studies and you can actually just get total number of samples associated with them. But on top of that, you can do the same thing where you can actually break down uh, the different cancer types that you want to take a look at, uh, click on any one of those and just explore the studies and get some just general information uh, about these particular studies of interest for you, or at least for the cancer types that you're looking at. Um, again, you know, these things are just, I love open source tools. I just absolutely love them. Um, you can, don't get me wrong, all this data is downloadable for you as well. Like you could literally just go ahead and grab this information if you so choose. Uh, for some of them, you can do germline analysis. You will have to log in and get approval uh, as a collaborator for those, uh, but that's a, a whole other story. GDC, I gotta be honest, I, one of the people that works with us at OSDR, uh, she was in charge of GDC over in Chicago um, and they actually used I think the backend APIs from OICR is ICGC. So a lot of the uh, kind of backend tools will look a little more familiar just because uh, they were using kind of the same backend. But it's the same type of thing. This was kind of the next generation for the Cancer Genome Atlas. Um, and again, it's really just an aggregation of uh, different ones from the US. Um, so you'll still get the same type of information there. Uh, so I'll just list all the databases we just looked at. You're more than welcome to kind of review those. Um, and, and really, that's really all I kind of wanted to convey with the database side of things. If you wanted a little more detail on kind of the construction, things like that, uh, Francis actually used to teach this section databases, uh, but a lot more emphasis was put on just the data types to get you more familiar with those. But feel free to take a peek at those and, uh, and play around with them because, again, there's just the opportunities there for you. <laughs> 